until 2005, when my house was destroyed by Hurricane Katrina, I hadn't thought so much about the concepts of resilience and recovery. What will it take for us to bounce back? What do we need in society or organizations to give us the capabilities that we need to come back after a major shock? So my house is up there. It's one of the little red dots on Canal Boulevard. In the year and a half after Hurricane Katrina, Rick Wheel and I sat down and went through the entire city of New Orleans knocking on doors, looking to talk to survivors there across the city. And we asked them a very simple question. On a scale of one to five, one being no and five being yes, have you recovered yet? How's the recovery process going for you? We mapped those answers to broader questions of damage to homes and businesses. So those red and green dots behind me, they're on a map that shows from yellow, very little water, to dark blue, very deep water. When we began doing this research, we expected that the reddish dots, the worst recovered people, would be in the darkest blue areas. But in fact, what we found was almost the opposite. In many cases, individuals who had fantastic recoveries, those green dots that you see, they had a lot of water. In my case, 11 feet of water. In other cases, seven or eight feet of water. Individuals' resilience and recovery wasn't a function, it seems, of how much water that they have. And the one thing I've learned since Hurricane Katrina is the power of people. We've heard already two different talks about how important communication individuals are and being a leader. Today's talk for me has really one main point. If you come away with the idea that social ties are the critical aspect of resilience, I've done my job. Because the reality is, a lot of theories that we have about recovery focus on the wrong kinds of ideas. I think the most common narrative that we hear in the media about recovery after disaster is about money. Did you have insurance? Was FEMA there for you afterwards? Were you wealthy beforehand? Did some foreign aid come in to India or to someplace in Southeast Asia after that 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami? That's a pretty common narrative that we hear. We also hear a lot about governance. How well governed was the area? Was the mayor, a governor, a president on board during that disaster? Plenty of stories from New Orleans we can talk about later about governance. A lot of theories about also destruction. How much damage was there? We envision that a stronger, more powerful disaster, a massive earthquake, for example, has a slower recovery process than a smaller scale disaster like a tornado. Two other theories I like to hear all the time. One is about population density, that somehow the dense areas and cities are slower to recover than rural areas. And finally, inequality. That image up there is from Brazil, the favelos, where we have on the left side of the image dirt floored shanty shacks. On the right side, condominiums. Those blue dots you see are individual pools. So these are the kind of theories that sociologists, political scientists, economists like to argue drive this idea of recovery. But they're all missing something really important. They're missing the idea that the core elements of recovery don't come from outside the community, outside the organization. They come from inside it. And I would argue that really drives the process what we call social capital or social ties. There are different types of connections that we have. People who are like us, same background, same language, same ethnicity, we call that a bonding social tie. Our friends, our family from different backgrounds, maybe through a school or a church or synagogue or a mosque, from a bocce ball club or through an opera club, those are bridging ties. And occasionally we have vertical ties to individuals in positions of power. Maybe you know the head of FEMA or the deputy assistant, I guess. Maybe you know someone here in Washington, DC. How do these kind of ties make a difference during disaster? The first decision made by any survivor after disaster is whether or not to go back to a damaged home or a damaged business. There are all kinds of reasons you wouldn't want to go back. The most obvious are the financial costs that you face. Even with insurance and help from FEMA, there's often a huge gap between the actual costs and the money that you now hold. But beyond the financial costs, there are psychological costs. If you lost a family member or a loved one that got hurt there, maybe the whole area nearby is destroyed, your school or home is gone. Simply being back in the same area again can trigger PTSD, sleepless nights, and depression. We also know there are opportunity costs for going back. Every day you're in a damaged city or a damaged area with a business or a school, it could be someplace else, a perfectly healthy area, and having that business run well. So why would you come back then with all those kind of costs? We found around the world, India, Japan, the Gulf Coast, Israel, those individuals, those communities with more social ties, more of a sense of place, a sense of belonging, those individuals come back. Individuals with fewer ties, fewer connections, or less of a sense of place, those individuals often get up and go.
We call this first choice exit and voice. The second broader way that these social ties help is what we call collective action. Many of the challenges that we face post-disaster cannot be solved by one individual or one family by themselves. It requires us working together. Think about Haiti after the 2011 earthquake, when that quake literally wiped out most of the government and police officers. Many neighborhoods had no one nearby in uniform to help them. How would your family stay safe and keep looters away? You couldn't do it by yourself. You weren't awake all the time. You need to have help from neighbors, people in the community, to build a community patrol. And some neighborhoods did that. They kept away looters. They kept away people who would harm their families. Others didn't have that kind of social ties, and they couldn't do it. These are the kind of things that we need post-disaster. We need the collective action through social ties. Finally, the third way these ties help is through informal insurance or mutual aid. Most of the providers of things like food, shelter, daycare for our kids, medical assistance, are often shut down for days, if not weeks. In New Orleans, where I was, it was two and a half months before a grocery store opened again, or three months before a gas station opened again, almost a half a year before daycares opened again. Where do you get assistance? Where do you get resources? If you have friends, neighbors, people that you know, you can knock on their door and borrow those kind of things, have a round robin to watch the kids, get information about restarting your electricity again. Without those kind of social ties, it's much more challenging to overcome these kind of pro problems. So social ties give us this kind of informal insurance or mutual aid. I want to give some details now how these kind of social ties make a difference during a massive three-part catastrophe. March 11th, 2011 in Japan, around 2.56 p.m., just after school was getting out, a massive 9.0 earthquake struck offshore. So powerful that from off outer space, the entire Earth jumped. Now, that earthquake itself didn't do much damage. There's fantastic engineering standards in Japan. Most houses, most buildings were intact. But that earthquake set off two other major problems. A massive set of tsunami, these huge waves, as tall as six stories in some cases, and the shutdowns of the Fukushima nuclear power plant, which eventually melted down about 27 hours later. Now, this disaster, or these disasters, killed more than 18,500 people across Japan. What's quite interesting is that if you look at all the cities along the coast, all the villages and towns, the variation in death rates are quite large. In most cities across the coast, no one lost their lives. That's the big spike you see behind me. But in those small little bumps next to it, in some cities, 1%, 2%, even as high as 10% of the population lost their lives. So as social scientists, our question is to understand why did some communities have no fatalities? Others lost literally a tenth of the population that afternoon. So we first envisioned maybe this was a function of how powerful the disaster was. So we simply mapped how tall the tsunami was versus the death rates in the communities. There's some variation that you see here that lines up, but some really strong outliers. The most powerful waves that we saw in Tanohata, 20 meters, at 60 feet tall, they only lost around 2% of the population. But Onagawa, Otsuchi, those communities had much shorter waves, but lost a tenth of the population. And even further on, Rifu Natori, very short waves that lost around 9% of the population. So by itself, we can't explain mortality based solely on how powerful the waves were. I spent about a year and a half in Japan doing research on this project, asking individuals who survived, speaking to NGOs, local leaders, getting data on all these communities to understand what then drove the differences in mortality. The most powerful predictor of recovery was actually social networks and social ties. Communities across the coast that had more social ties, here we're measuring this using less crime, those communities had much lower death rates, holding everything else constant, meaning even the same levels of demographics, of income, of education, firefighters being there, disaster preparedness, exposure to the sea, height, all the factors that we could think of, the best predictors still were the social ties in those communities. Communities that had more social ties before the disaster had fewer casualties afterwards. Then we looked at the question of recovery. Who rebuilds these cities after massive devastation? This is an image of Ishinomaki, two weeks and then roughly two years after that tsunami. Notice all the debris is gone, but so are all the people. There's no evidence in this community, even though the debris is gone, there's businesses operating again or schools operating again. So I spent about another year in Japan asking questions of businesses, local leaders, educators. What's driving the recovery processes? How do you know if your city is up and operating again? 
spent some time in Tagajo. So here are three images, two weeks, two months, and two years. Now the debris is gone. I can't tell you why that white van is still there. <laughs> I have a theory about insurance fraud. That's a different conversation. But here again, we see progress over time. The debris is gone, but we don't really know. Are those fields productive again? Are individual farmers producing again? So we measured the recovery in 14 different ways. We looked at things like business restarts, infrastructure, housing rebuilds, school openings. Can you guess what the best predictor of recovery in this case was? So this is a map we can show you. What happens between the first moment of the tsunami, that massive amount of damage, and then two years later. The bottom axis is in a scale from 10 to 60. That's the capacity of each city that was still there during that process. So you see some of the most damaged areas that we have there, like Yamada, lost 85% of capacity. Almost all the schools, businesses, everything was shut down. But then two years later, it bounces up. This is the vertical axis now, to around 80%, 90%. Most communities are doing pretty well two years later. Some aren't doing so well. So in investigating those factors, the best predictor we had here weren't horizontal ties, that bonding and bridging ties, it was linking ties. How many connections did your city have to individuals in power in Tokyo? How many powerful politicians, representatives, people did you know that could pull those levels of power and get people to come to your community and help you out in the recovery process? So in the first stages of survival, it's the horizontal ties. In the process of recovery, it's the vertical ties. I'll take one more aspect of recovery. This is mental health recovery. I mentioned the Fukushima disaster in Japan. 147,000 people left their homes because of, of four-hour evacuation notices in Futaba, Okuma, communities right near the nuclear power plant. Some of them have never been home since. So now in 2018, it's been almost seven years since they've seen their homes. Now, in those seven years, you can imagine the kind of worries that you have. If your house was less than 10 miles away from the plant that melted down, and you left there maybe a day, maybe two days later, with only a bag of stuff and your kids. You can imagine all the kind of concerns. Livelihood, health, are my children going to be okay? Am I going to be okay? Can I ever go home again? So we knew up front that individuals, these survivors from communities nearby, would have a lot of worries that we didn't as normal people outside the area. So we use a simple mental health checklist called the Kessler 6 or K6. Now don't answer out loud, but in your head, think to yourself, over the past month, how often have you felt nervous? Maybe speaking in front of all audiences, right? How often have you felt helpless or restless, depressed? So these K6 are a pretty common way of measuring mental health recovery post-disaster. So the last seven years we've been asking survivors from Futaba these questions, these K6 index and comparing their results to individuals who lived further away from the nuclear power plant and individuals even more than 150 miles, 200 miles away. We had some very interesting results. We assumed that things like physical health and wealth would help improve those K6 scores. We assumed if you had money for a psychiatrist or a counselor, or you could move away from the area or get a new home, we figured those individuals would do better over time. The reality was, as these images show, we had no measurable connection between health and wealth and mental anxiety after the Fukushima meltdowns. In fact, the reality was it was a pretty sad story. If you'd been doing well physically before the disaster, you were okay afterwards. But if you had any kind of physical challenges beforehand, your mental health got even worse compared to other individuals nearby. So what can alleviate these kind of concerns? The only factor that we found consistently helped reduce anxiety post a nuclear evacuation were having friends and neighbors nearby that you knew. Social connections to individuals nearby helped you feel normal again, despite all the long-term concerns you may still have. So I've tried to argue so far that what's driving the recovery process, what's giving us resilience, that's coming from things like social ties, friends, neighbor, and friends of friends. If this is true then, what's our next steps? This is the fun part of my job. Beyond studying just disasters, I think through cities, communities, organizations, what can we do now to build these kind of social ties around the world? So hopefully you recognize the guy in the red sweater. It's Fred Rogers, right? Now, Fred has been dead, unfortunately, now for a few years. When I was a kid, he asked me to be a very good neighbor each day, right? What does that mean? It means in most of the areas around the world, Washington, DC, Tokyo, Mumbai, Bangladesh, people simply don't know their neighbors. So if I asked you in this audience to raise your hand if you can name 10 neighbors' last names, 
Some hands go up. Okay, that's not bad. Typically, it's around 15% of individuals living in highly dense areas can name those 10 neighbors' last names. The first line of defense, really the zero responder, isn't someone wearing a uniform, right? It's your neighbor, it's your friend, it's someone who lives nearby. So right now, in places like Wellington, New Zealand, in Tokyo, in San Francisco, we're building get-to-know-your-neighbor programs, chances to show each other who lives nearby. How do you build those bonds? By pushing individuals to think through who will be on your doorstep if your mom has a heart attack. Who will be there if it's flooding and your dog needs to be rescued? These are people who live nearby. The next step up from neighbors is the neighborhood. That's the next image I have up there. We call this the block party or neighbor fest. If you live in San Francisco, once a year we'll give you up to $5,000 to hold a party in your neighborhood. Two conditions. You can't exclude anyone, even the neighbor that you hate, and you also have to agree to have at least one small display about CPR or disaster preparedness. We know that many neighbors don't leave their homes nowadays. People with long driveways especially, off-street parking or garages. Many of us simply haven't gotten beyond even our immediate neighbors. So neighbor fest is one way of doing this. Now in Japan, we call this a matsuri or a festival. Obon, for example, is one of them. A chance to get outside your immediate block, meet people nearby who'll be working with post-disaster. Beyond neighbors and neighborhood, we know that physical infrastructure drives recovery. It drives the social ties that we have. So the good thing about a disaster, it's a chance to rebuild neighborhoods in new ways. So right now in places like Masakicho in Japan, in Nepal and in the Philippines, my team is working to help build different ways of living together. Most of us in Washington DC probably have condos or apartments. You've got a completely private space. We're building new types of living spaces with shared dining and sitting spaces, private sleeping quarters, but shared spaces to work and live together during the day. Attempts to build people's trusts together. So these kind of policy recommendations. Three more ideas quickly. One is simply getting out of your home and going to meetings. That's the image you have like a focus group. PTA groups, zoning boards, local school events, those are simply ways of building trust and community by leaving your area and getting to know your neighbors. We're also trying things like community currencies. That's the Toronto dollar up there. If you volunteer for an hour, we'll give you five Toronto dollars. That money cannot be spent at Walmart or McDonald's or Costco, no chain stores. The money's only good at local stores, mom and pop stores, farmer markets, barber shops. So we incentivize volunteering. You leave your house, you get that money, and you spend it at local businesses, and you get to know them. The business now holds that money. So what do they do? They go to other businesses. We call this a virtuous cycle. We have more volunteering in communities like this, more trust and more interactions over time. Finally, I've got an image from Facebook up there. Many of us are on our phones right now. Right? That social media that we have is a critical aspect, especially if you're under 75. Right? Those phones, those cellular devices are critical. So we have new platforms that we're using right now, like Nextdoor and Facebook, to make these connections more plausible and more helpful during disasters. You may have seen on Facebook the check-in function to check in safe. We have a new one we're developing right now. We're on Facebook. If you're in a disaster, you can say, my kid needs diapers, I need food, and individuals who live nearby will be connected to you, and you can exchange resources. This is coming really soon. Today, I've tried to argue several things. First of all, I've argued that many of us think about recovery often in terms of things like how much damage there was, or how much money we have, right? how wealthy we are. The reality I've tried to argue is that disaster resilience comes not from those external factors, or wealth, or education, but from internal ones to the community and the organization. How connected are we? How much trust do we have in each other? How often do we work together? In the process of surviving a tsunami, and in the process of mental health after tsunami, those horizontal ties are critical. In the process of building back, in the recovery process then, vertical ties between cities and representatives, or cities and things are really critical as well. We've seen now that social media can be a critical component of what's going on. So I would argue today, if you go back to your organizations with one message, here's the message. Build those social ties, make those friendships. Thank you very much. So one of the challenges I've seen is that many of us in the field of disasters, we have one mode, it's kind of doom and gloom, right? We go out and say, you're gonna die, right? Things are gonna go really, really badly, you'll have no food for three days. We found there's a different way to do this. Uh, in New Zealand, for example, in Wellington, W-R-E-M-O, the Wellington Regional Management, Mor 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 Management Organization, REMO, they spend time not on doom and gloom, but building trust.
one third of their office personnel are out of their office every day, embedded in schools, churches, synagogues, mosques, PTA groups, bocce ball clubs. They spend a third of their time outside the office building trust with local organizations. Why? Because if you trust you during normal times, they're going to come to you during those crisis times as well. Right now, a tenth of the traffic that goes through Facebook is on their page. Nothing to do with disasters. Local colleges have a party, they advertise it on their page. Local people want to get rid of stuff, they advertise it on their page. This page is the go-to point because it's trusted by individuals. When that big earthquake comes to New Zealand as it will, and tsunami warnings come as they will, Remo is positioned now to be trusted by individuals living nearby. So their method has been to build trust through being there in the community, not just at times of crisis, but all the entire year. Yeah, this is a hard one because we found, whether it's North America, India, Japan, or Israel, these ties are often idiosyncratic, meaning we can't predict why you might have them. Maybe you're a friend of the mayor or the governor. Maybe you had a time you had some kind of workshop there in Washington, D.C. or at FEMA. Really hard for us to predict them. So what we found is encouraging local managers to think through who's above them, to meet them ahead of time. So we often encourage, for example, in India, people have often never met the local people they, they work with and representatives, politicians and bureaucrats. We encourage them to use email and phones to get in touch with them. Here in North America, it might be a workshop that we have, bringing local regional representatives to a local community that's, that's vulnerable, like Gulf Coast, for example, or sending those people out from the city to meet people nearby. Oftentimes, we really don't know who they are until the disaster. This is the old talk about, you know, exchanging business cards at the site of the disaster is too late. So anything that we can do early, ahead of time, for local, local community members, but also people in DC or wherever else they are, making those decisions, get to know the community, right? Those individuals, those ties will be critical later on. I think it's even worse than that. We've asked people all the time, who helped you? We, we ask people who've been through disasters in North America and elsewhere, who helped you when you were in trouble? They say, they say something like this, oh, it was FEMA. Even if FEMA wasn't even the area nearby, it was the Red Cross, it was an NGO nearby, it was a church. Oftentimes individuals who've been through disasters simply don't recognize who they're working with. And this is a real challenge for us, I think, in the disaster field. There's no recognition of local versus regional versus national. Um, people I've talked to assume FEMA will be there with pickaxes, oxygen masks, and, and door cutters. I think we all know that's not going to happen in most cases, right? Maybe some of you guys volunteer in the free time, but that's not gonna happen. So this is a real challenge. Um, most North Americans, at least, simply don't know that much about what FEMA does or what organizations like the Red Cross do or how those lines do or don't connect. So part of the process of educating the community is before the disaster, again, telling them this is the framework that we have. This is the NRDF framework that we have. This is the local community framework that we have. San Francisco, for example, has a lot of meetings every month just to tell people this is the people that you might work with. Here's the NGOs nearby. Here's the local organizations nearby. Here's the city government. Here's the California government. And here's FEMA. They spend time looking sure local leaders know who those individuals are so you don't have that kind of confusion during the disaster. Yeah, this is a big problem. You know, what we've found is that horizontal ties are much easier to cultivate, right? So encouraging communities to get outside, to meet their neighbors, to volunteer. Much harder to tell individuals, go write a letter to your politician, go visit them in DC or in Tokyo in this case. It's also kind of inequitable at some levels, right? Meaning if you have those politicians who you know well and they're actively working for you in the center of power, it's a very different story than a community nearby that also went through the disaster that doesn't have those vertical ties. So this is a challenge, I think, for us to think through, the ethics of disaster recovery. I know certainly in North America, we have plenty of data that shows better committed communities get money first, uh, they get money more quickly. We also know, for example, that, that block grants, uh, which I think are ending, if I remember correctly, haven't been given out so randomly either. There's several papers that we've written as a team that show disaster aid is politicized. It, it is politicized, uh, both international and domestic, meaning we give aid to certain countries more quickly, other countries not as much. And internally, the aid itself doesn't flow as equally across, despite our best efforts to help those who've been damaged. So I think this is a real point where the data show, despite our best hopes, that disaster aid comes to those who need it. I think that the reality is that disaster help comes to those who are connected to other people. And that's a problem, right? Building those horizontal and vertical ties. I'm not sure there's an easy answer that we can have that will make it less equitable, or sorry, more equitable across the society right now. It's interesting. You know, people often assume Japan is best situated, a most homogenous country, you know, a lot of social conformity. The reality is there's variation even in Japan. 
So even those cities I mentioned along the coast in Japan had huge variations in social tie levels and trust as well. I always argue like this, even in societies like Japan or places like New York City, we might imagine is much more heterogeneous, there's pockets of strong social ties and neighborhoods right nearby where it's really, really weak. It's almost like a, a checkerboard in a sense. Uh, New Orleans is the same thing. Where we lived in New Orleans, we had places like Lakeview, Ninth Ward, uh, Broadmoor. Those communities themselves might be well connected to each other or internally, but not well externally. So I'm not sure there's only one country that's done it right. I know for a fact that New Zealand and Japan have tried to invest in social capital in a way that I'm not quite sure we're quite there yet in North America. Many people that I talk to at the local level agree with me that social ties matter. Then I ask for funding and then the conversation gets a lot quieter, right? <laughs> so you know, how do we go from agreeing the idea that these ties are measurable, for example, that they can be captured just like any other social tie or physical tie? but that we need to invest in them. Uh, right now, for example, Boulder, Colorado has a great program called Boko Strong, a very localized program run by citizens there in Boulder that builds these kind of social ties. I mentioned San Francisco and Boston. Both those cities have chief resilience officers working from the Rockefeller cities, working on ideas of social cohesion as well. So I see pockets of areas that are doing it well. I haven't really seen one country where it's, let's say, uniformly doing well across the country. This is a great question. So we've noticed that basically it's strongly demographic by age who uses these kind of platforms, Nextdoor, Facebook, and so forth. We think they've got great potential to do this because they have information on where we are. If you're holding a phone right now, it's probably telling someone else where you are in this building in Washington, DC. So we'd like to increase social network use, especially among the elderly, who often can't get out of their homes. And certainly in Japan as well, there are attempts to train individuals over 70, over 75, and having a phone or a platform they can work on, a tablet often larger than a phone, so it's more easy to see. So we think there are, there's a possibility, but again, we need funds in these communities and focus on them, recognizing these are a lifeline in many cases for individuals who can't get out. Uh, we found, of course, in all these disasters, the most vulnerable populations are the elderly. So the more that we can do to build social ties through media, I think would be a great plan.